Today we get to focus on Habakkuk, a rarely talked about small book of the Bible that packs a big punch. Habakkuk is a prophet who lived in the southern kingdom right before the exile, and it's possible that the book took shape while in exile. Habakkuk knew the end was going to come. He knew Jerusalem and Judah were going to fall. Things were getting hard. Their violent enemies were breathing down their necks, and the people themselves were becoming corrupt and evil. But there is hope to come. Hear now the word of the Lord. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? You will not listen. Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strifeful and content arises. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Though the fig tree does not blossom, and no fruit is on the vines, Though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, even into the midst of our hardest times you come. Even into our hardship and our pain and our sorrow you come. So come to us now, come to us this morning, and open our hearts and minds so that we might hear your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I heard the chef from Prairie Street Brewing Company talk to a group of young professionals this week. I don't know him, but he seems to love what he does. He stood in the middle of a group of young professionals full of confidence and excited to share about what he does and the food he creates. When someone asked him, what is your favorite dish? He almost looked pained and says, oh, that's like asking which is your favorite child? I always love to see people enjoying what they do and I enjoy his food, so I'm grateful. He told us how they like to create specific beers to match with specific foods. And as I'm saying this, I'm reminded of one of my all-time favorite TV commercials. It's the Miller High Life commercial where the beer delivery guy goes into the fancy restaurant to take back his beer for the regular folk. He walks out saying, $8.50 for a hamburger, you must, or, or sorry, $11.50 for a hamburger, you must be crazy. I do know the critique of the craft beer and foodie scene, although I'll have to say I am one of them. Minus the beer, that is lost on me. Anyway, the amazing chef at the Prairie Street Brewing Company, who loves his job and is good at it, tells the story of asking the beer makers to make a smoky beer for a private party whose theme was smoked everything. So he chose some beautiful apples, he carefully smoked them, 
gave them to the beer guys to create something wonderful with these time-intensive loved apples. And when the moment came to taste their amazing idea that would be the hit of this party, it was terrible. He said it tasted like you were drinking a campfire, ashes and all. <laughs> and then he said something profound. Yeah, sometimes things don't always work out. Yeah, sometimes things don't always work out. And I don't know why that struck me so, maybe because this passage was in the back of my mind, but yeah, that's right. Even with our best of intentions, even with our hopes and our dreams, even with our deepest love and our brightest minds, things don't always work out. I think we all can resonate. Habakkuk's oracle that he either saw others saying or said himself or both seems like, are you eavesdropping on our society from a thousand years ago? There is violence everywhere, and God seems not to care. There is wrongdoing and trouble. The wicked are surrounding the righteous and getting the upper hand. And I don't know about you, but it just seems like the world is hard to handle some days. The violence in our world seems to proliferate the innocent, whether they are at worship in Pittsburgh, line dancing outside L.A., at a mall in Louisville, or here in Rockford crossing the street. Why, O oh Lord, how long shall we cry for help and you not listen? This is a very typical lament in the Bible and one that God can handle coming from us as well. Probably more of our prayers should start out with, Why, O oh Lord? This passage says the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. And I think about the caravan of neighbors who this week we have welcomed with tear gas and rubber bullets. Our friend and local attorney Linda Zuba is heading to Tijuana, Mexico as we worship right now and she asked for us to pray for her. Though you would never know it when you meet her, she is an immigrant from Colombia, and she talks about the ways that she was welcomed and never questioned on her status and how that wide open reception changed the trajectory of her life. So she's going to volunteer her bilingual legal skills and our prayers go with her. Slack laws allowing for evil to creep into the ways we treat our neighbors. How long shall we cry for help and you not listen, O Lord? In Habakkuk, though, the Lord speaks. And aren't we ready for God to say similarly to what God said through Isaiah a couple weeks ago? Don't worry, I got it. I'll send a rumor and turn the army around and everything will be okay. Don't worry, I got this. I'm just going to fix up these laws really quickly so people's basic human dignity will be honored when they approach our borders, and then you all can decide if they stay or whether or not you'll fix up their homeland. Don't worry, tomorrow is a new day and everything will be better. But God doesn't say that. Don't worry, tomorrow is a new day is what we're looking for. But God instead gives that dreaded four-letter word. Wait. 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 For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Righteous live by their faith. The righteous live by their faith. They don't sulk in their woe is my situation, woe is our city, woe is our world. No, they live by faith. They live by faith that knowing that one tomorrow is going to be different than today because God is making all things new. They live by faith trusting that God is working out a plan of salvation for all people, places, and things. They live by faith hoping that soon the world will be as God dreams where all people are loved and cherished and everyone has a safe home, food to eat, and meaningful employment. I don't know about you, but when I get down about things 
it feels like life will never change, that the situation will always be the same, that for the rest of eternity my infant son will wake me up four times a night. Now almost three years later, I, can tell, I can't tell my tired and frustrated self back then that life will be different and that God will infuse change, but I wish I could. A few months ago, I hung out with a teenager, a cousin of sorts, who I love dearly, who is suffering a deep depression. And the one thing I wanted to tell him, which is the one thing I knew he would not be able to hear, is that this is a phase, a season, and there will be other seasons in life. Don't project this on to the rest of your life. God is good and working on your future to bring about what is good and holy and just. The righteous live by faith. And Habakkuk responds, Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on its vine, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. And this faith isn't the, I'll just sit around and watch the news and see what happens. It's, the, it's not the hope and pray only type faith. This is an active faith. This is a faith that gets up and does something to move God's agenda forward. This is an active faith, a faith that has energy, intelli intelligence, imagination, and love. This is a faith that gives a pair of boots to the children of the neighborhood school who wouldn't be able to play outside or have dry feet this winter. Yesterday, as Steve said, these pews were lined with boots, 299 pairs. Karen Olson has the process down to a science, and we were done in no time. But what a beautiful and lovely act, church, that you have done. In a world that can seem so depressing, in a world where there are big problems, in a city where the problems can dominate, it can be overwhelming to think about what we can possibly do. But that is it. That is how we live by faith. We can do what we can do, and we should, and we did. And no boots are not going to solve world hunger, but they're a kind gesture that will keep kids' feet dry and warm and allowing for them to get to school more safely on the sidewalks and to give them a better chance of having fun outside. But it also says to those children, we see you, we know that you are there, we care about you, and your life matters to us. And that is living by faith. It's not easy to wait, but it is the message of Advent. In Advent, we wait for the birth of Christ. We know what is to come. We know that Jesus brings peace and hope and love and joy, but we also know that it is his mission that we also know that his mission with our world and with us is not complete. And so we wait. And there is nothing like the joy of the secular holiday season to reflect back to us what is missing, who is missing, the feeling that is not quite there, the depression that is creeping back in. And so we wait. We wait for the Jesus to complete the salvation of this world. We wait for the day when all things will be made right and new. We wait we don't like it. I hate waiting, and I know you do too. I like things to be accomplished yesterday. But God says to us, wait, and in the waiting, be faithful. Don't waste the waiting, as painful as it can be. Be faithful in all times and in all seasons. Wait for the Lord turns out it takes about six weeks to brew beer, and they had time to recover from their smoked apple fail. They found some nicely smoked wheat and turned that beverage, and turned it into a beverage with subtle flavors of smoky layers. Phew! Their waiting was not in vain, and neither is ours. Thanks be to God. Amen.